47-year-old Irina Malezik emigrated to the United States in search of the life she dreamed of. For years, she longed to experience the West. Leaving her native Ukraine behind, she arrived in New York and quickly picked up work as a Russian translator. Soon, she was hired by the federal government and became involved in cases covering a span from Medicaid fraud to Russian organized crime. Then, on a cool October day in 2007, she walked out of her Brighton Beach apartment and seemingly vanished. Considering the sensitive nature of her work, the FBI got involved in the investigation and began looking for connections between her work and her disappearance. They had a long list of potential suspects from high-level mafia figures to low-level violent offenders. Soon, however, the dots would be connecting in a way they'd never imagined. First, there was the man she was afraid of, the man she told friends she desperately wanted out of her life. Soon, federal agents would find themselves in the midst of a brutal and violent campaign of blood and money. There was Michael Klein, who'd gone missing four years earlier in December of 2003. He had worked a business deal with the man Irina feared. Then there was Viktor Alexiev, a neighbor and friend of that man. He too had gone missing, but was ultimately found across the state line in New Jersey. His body dismembered and spread into four large trash bags. Lying beside them was a ghoulish Halloween mask of a bloody-mouthed Dracula. Had Irina been the target of organized crime? Had her work taken her to dangerous places? Or was it possible that a Russian immigrant with a taste for the luxurious side of life was supporting his richy lifestyle through the blood and stolen identities of a series of victims he'd carefully selected and preyed upon? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 193, The Disappearance of Irina Malezik. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious disappearance of 47-year-old Irina Malezik. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Irina Malezik came to the United States to create a new life for herself, a world shaped by her own hard work and determination. Sadly, her life and dreams would be destroyed by a monster infected with greed and violence. This is episode 193, The Disappearance of Irina Malezik. Olga Fischer was getting worried. It had been weeks since she'd heard from her dear friend Irina, and for two people who spent time together almost every day, it was highly unusual to be out of contact for such an extended period of time. Olga did everything a good friend should. She called, left messages, and even dropped by, knocking on the door to Irina's Brighton Beach co-op. But there was nothing. No sound inside, no replies, no returned calls. Frustrated, concerned, and frightened, Olga finally contacted the New York Police Department, meeting them at the building. Inside, they found no trace of the missing woman. Her apartment was neat and orderly. Her license and important personal documents were still there, tucked into filing cabinets and locked in her desk. Her mailbox, though, was another story, overflowing with unread letters and bills. For a reliable woman who'd never been late on a rent payment in her life, that all changed in November. It didn't take long for investigators to find their own reasons for concern. Arena had been working as a Russian translator for the federal government, mostly on cases connected to Medicaid fraud and the Russian mafia. While they began to wonder if perhaps Arena could have been targeted by someone in organized crime as retribution for her work with the government, friends couldn't help but think of her mysterious disappearance being connected in some way to the intense fear she'd expressed about a man in her life that she just couldn't find a way to get rid of. 
investigators had no way of knowing that their simple missing persons investigation would slowly transform into the hunt for a brutal, sadistic, and cold-blooded killer. Irina Molesik was born on Thursday, July 7, 1960, in Kiev, Ukraine. She was an only child born to a mother who's been referred to as a homemaker and a father who at the time was working as a government diplomat. While we know very little of Irina's childhood, let alone the vast majority of her life, it's been stated that she was raised in Kiev, where she attended school and eventually went on to university. Irina grew up in a very different Ukraine from the one we think of today, as for the first three decades of her life, the country was under the control of the USSR, until declaring itself an independent state in August of 1991, just a month after Irina's 31st birthday. As a result of the state of her country throughout her childhood and well into adulthood, Irina was brought up and educated to speak Ukrainian and Russian. In addition to this, perhaps as part of the typical curriculum or as a result of her father's government position, she was also instructed in and became fluent in English. While we can't know the timeline for certain, it's since been suggested that Irina developed an interest and fascination with the West throughout her teen years, and as she grew older, she solidified her dreams into plans for a reality, to leave Ukraine behind and emigrate to the United States. What we do know is that Arena's dream became a reality when she was 39 years old. In the spring of 2000, perhaps through the assistance of a program run through a Baptist church, Irina left Ukraine and flew more than 4,000 miles, arriving in eastern Canada. There, she spent a short time wading through paperwork and red tape before finally, as spring began transitioning to summer, she was able to cross the southern border, arriving in New York. Arena would eventually settle into the Brighton Beach neighborhood in southern Brooklyn. At that time, and still today, this area is commonly referred to as Little Odessa, due to the large population of Russian and Eastern European immigrants making up the community. The name of Little Odessa refers to Ukraine's port city and resort town along the Black Sea. Of the nearly 600,000 Russian immigrants living in the state of New York, the vast majority can be found in Brighton Beach or the neighboring Sheepshead Bay. While this was an area known for a large influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe throughout the early parts of the 20th century, those numbers grew drastically after the rise of the Soviet Union and the beginning of the Cold War in the years following the Second World War. By the 1970s, as the Soviets began relaxing immigration policies, the number of people coming to the area increased dramatically, resulting in Brighton Beach becoming known as home to the highest concentration of Russians in the Western Hemisphere, with a large majority of businesses and storefronts sporting the Cyrillic alphabet. While crime grew rapidly through New York in the 70s, Little Odessa was not immune to the creeping expanse of gangs, drugs, and violence. As a result, property values and living conditions declined. However, through the 1980s, while crime was still an issue, the demand for housing and businesses in the area increased, resulting in the rise of property values. This contrast of increased costs of living and crime resulted in a small exodus, with some members of the community seeking out the safety and comfort of more suburban living, heading towards areas further east on Long Island, ending up in western Nassau County. By the time of Arena's arrival in 2000, Brighton Beach was beginning to teeter on the edge of overpopulation and a transition, as over the next 10 years there would come a large influx of new residents, emigrating predominantly from Central Asia. It was, and remains, an eclectic area where Russian is spoken more predominantly than English, and the community shares a bond of having similar life experiences which can, sometimes, lead to there being a sense of privacy and seclusion for those from the outside who pass through or stick around for visits. When first arriving in Brooklyn, Arena had originally settled into an apartment northwest of Brighton, located along 26th Avenue. However, within two years, she had moved into a fifth-floor apartment on Corbin Place, which represents a boundary line between Brighton Beach to the west and Manhattan Beach to the east. It was there, in apartment 5J, that Arena would spend the remaining years of her life, living in what has been described as a small, one-bedroom apartment with a beautiful view of the Atlantic Ocean. Irina began to develop a small circle of friends, many of whom would go on to describe her as quiet, polite, and kind, 
But one word stuck out above all others. Workaholic. Arena had a strong work ethic and poured much of herself into her job, working long hours and sacrificing much of her free time to help out and offer assistance wherever she could. Of course, while to her friends it seemed Arena worked too much, the nature of her career put her in a position of danger, and as such, it was important to ensure everything was done and done right. One of Arena's first jobs came when she was hired onto a law firm which held a large Russian and Eastern European clientele. There, she was able to use her language skills as a translator, working directly with Russian and Ukrainian-speaking clients. Her skills didn't go unnoticed, and by 2007, when Arena was 47 years old, she was hired on as a translator working for the federal court system, where she was most directly involved in working with the government in two different but not entirely separate areas, Medicaid fraud and Russian organized crime. Irina would work on several high-profile cases in which members of the Russian mob were prosecuted for a slew of different offenses, from racketeering to murder. Due to the possibility of violent retribution from those she helped prosecute, she had to learn to be protective of herself and exclusive in her social circle. She also continued to do translating for local law firms as a way of bringing in some extra income. One of Irina's closest friends was a woman named Olga Fischer, who lived just a few blocks away from her Corbin Place apartment. The two became friends quickly, and despite Arena's hectic work schedule, which saw her being involved in state and federal court trials, they always found time to spend together. For the most part, that time was during the morning, when the two would meet up for breakfast and then spend time talking while strolling along the boardwalk. There, the two would watch the sun rise over the Atlantic while joking around, sharing stories, and asking one another for advice. Speaking to the Park City Daily News, Olga would describe her friend saying she was, quote, very intelligent, very intellectual, and a very hardworking and good friend, end quote. Being that the two kept in such tight communication with one another, Olga grew concerned in the fall of 2007 when she struggled to reach Arena. The two spoke for the last time on the afternoon of Monday, October 15th, But following that day, repeated calls to Arena went unanswered and unreturned. Assuming that maybe her friend was just overwhelmed with work, Olga didn't think too much about it, though she did continue calling despite the lack of a response. As the days of October began growing shorter, Olga started leaving messages on Arena's answering machine, but again, didn't receive any calls in return. By the end of the month, Olga called several more times, but was no longer able to leave a message instead being greeted by an automated voice informing her that the machine was full. Frustrated, she went by and knocked on Arena's door several times, but no one came to the door and she never heard any sounds coming from inside the apartment. Olga placed a call to Arena sometime during the afternoon of Tuesday, November 6th. According to her, she recalls once again listening to the phone ringing several times before she was met with the same automated message. What concern Olga had weeks earlier had since grown into something more encompassing, but Olga didn't yet believe this was a situation that required legal action. All of that would change, however, two days later on Thursday, November 8th. This time, when Olga called back, the automated message was gone, indicating that someone had since accessed Arena's answering machine and cleared the previous recordings. After several calls went unanswered that day, Olga finally contacted authorities. She explained to the New York Post, quote, That's when I started to panic. I didn't know what was going on. End quote. After contacting the New York Police Department, Olga proceeded over to Arena's apartment where she met officers to take her missing persons report. Executing a wellness check, the officers gained entry to the apartment. There was no sign of the 47 year old, though there were indications that the apartment hadn't been occupied for several weeks. Arena's mailbox was overflowing with unopened letters, and her landlord confirmed that she had not, as of that time, made her monthly rent payment. In hopes of finding some answers, police were able to obtain surveillance video footage from the lobby of the building, and they began reviewing it, starting with the last day she spoke to Olga, Monday, October 15th. According to the FBI, Olga's last phone call with Arena occurred at 1.26 p.m., Not long after the completion of that call, another call came into the apartment, and then Arena was found on the surveillance footage. 
the 47-year-old was seen wearing a dark jacket and carrying what appeared to be a cosmetics bag as she walked through the lobby and exited the building. However, where she had gone after she passed through the doors was a mystery with detectives noting that she could have turned left, heading towards Brighton Beach Avenue and the busy area of the neighborhood, or perhaps right, heading towards the boardwalk and the Atlantic Ocean. Digging into Irina's life, the NYPD quickly became aware of the sensitive nature of her job, and so somewhat of a divide was created between those who thought her disappearance might be criminal and could be connected to her work, and others who argued that she was an intelligent, capable woman who was free to go off anywhere she pleased without the need to notify anyone. It doesn't appear as though a lot of work was done following the report that Arena was missing. While investigators spoke to friends and co-workers, no one seemed to have any idea of where she might have gone, nor did anyone share any information about someone she may have been afraid of or any situations that could have put her at risk. For the most part, November and December would pass without any major searches, no media announcements, nor anything outside of a very basic investigation. Essentially, in an area where the NYPD receives more than 13,000 missing persons reports each year, they weren't afforded the time to dig too deeply. Of course, others would argue, and justifiably so, that much of the delay in the investigation came as a result of a disinterested state of mind. As one reporter would later put it, Arena lived in an area populated with a large majority of immigrants, many of whom either returned home or moved on without telling anyone and never forged strong ties to that community. And so her disappearance was initially viewed from the narrow scope that she'd either turn back up or she wouldn't. But there was no evidence to suggest any crime had actually taken place, and thus there wasn't much which could be done. All of that, however, would change in January of 2008 when the media finally got their hands on the story. According to the New York Post, who reached out to the NYPD for comment, the investigation hadn't uncovered much at that point. According to investigators, they had searched for Arena at many area hospitals and morgues, while also considering her in any situations in which a Jane Doe was recovered, but they hadn't managed to make any solid links. One new detail showed additional cause for concern, however, as it was reported that upon searching Arena's apartment, investigators had discovered that she'd left her ID and personal documents behind, which seemed unlikely in a situation in which she may have elected to go elsewhere. At that time, the NYPD also noted that they were digging into Arena's financial accounts in hopes of finding evidence as to where she may have gone after leaving her apartment three months earlier. Just one day later, it was officially announced that the FBI were joining the NYPD in their missing persons investigation, with the feds coming from an angle that perhaps Arena's disappearance was tied to her work with the Russian mafia. On Wednesday, January 16th, the FBI arrived at her Corbin Place apartment to search for any clues as to where she may have gone. It was hoped that financial and personal documents left behind might give them some indication of whether or not her disappearance was connected to a criminal matter or not. Mustafa Donik, the supervisor of Arena's building, explained the mystery to the Post, saying, quote, Nobody has heard from her. She has no relationships, no friends who come here that I know of. I hope she comes back. That's what we're hoping. She just disappeared. It's a shame. End quote. According to the FBI, following the search of her apartment, they'd spoken with several of Arena's friends and co workers. While the vast majority knew little of her personal life, describing her as very private and quiet, at least a few people expressed that they had reason for concern. Federal agents quickly learned that there was a man in Arena's life who she'd express fear of. No one knew much about him, nor why Arena feared him though several friends were able to confirm that the man was known as Dimitri and that Arena was expecting a call from him in the days leading up to her disappearance, a call that, according to friend Alla Berger, Arena was not looking forward to, as she told the Post, she didn't want to hear from him. Unfortunately, a name as common as Dimitri without any additional identifying descriptions would be hard to track down in Little Odessa. With the FBI coming into the investigation, the case would be spread across three separate teams. The FBI, operating out of Lower Manhattan, made their primary focus Arena's work. They began going through all of the court cases she was connected to, seeking any connections where she may have been targeted for her involvement. In addition to this, 
They met with local police in an attempt to determine whether or not Arena may have been killed or perhaps abducted, but nothing seemed to lock into place. They couldn't find any evidence linking Arena's disappearance to any of the cases she'd worked on. While they were going through court records, the NYPD were examining Arena's financial and phone records for any clues. Meanwhile, another bureau of the FBI, operating out of Queens, were following up on a series of claims received from jailhouse informants, which suggested that Arena had been targeted by the mafia. However, not the Russian mafia, but instead the Italian mafia. All three of these groups of investigators were being overseen by the U.S. Attorney's Office of Eastern New York. While investigators continued trying to find any indication of what may have happened to Arena, they continued to hit dead end after dead end. The court records weren't providing any solid leads, and the jailhouse rumors were ruled out one by one. Ultimately, it would be through Arena's financial records that the first major break in the case would be uncovered. A red flag popped up in a series of transactions conducted on October 15th, the last day Irina was seen alive. Four checks totaling $6,475 were deposited into a bank account at a Citibank branch in nearby Coney Island. Examination of the check showed that Irina's signature had been poorly forged, not even resembling her actual signature. These checks had been deposited into an account owned by a married couple, Julia and Dmitry Yakovlev. Obviously, for investigators, finding a direct link to the name Dmitry made them believe they were on the right path. Following through Irina's financial records, the second red flag occurred the day after her disappearance on Tuesday, October 16th. That day, someone claiming to be Irina had called Discover opening a credit card in her name. That card was then used to make a series of withdrawals from five different ATMs and several purchases from high-end stores, totaling approximately $37,000. On Wednesday, October 17th, a lone woman entered a Brooklyn jewelry store and purchased two Frank Mueller watches, a men's master banker model and a woman's Curvex. The purchase of the watches came to $16,200, And as a result of the high price being covered by a credit card, the shop owner requested a verification of identification. The woman, claiming to be Irina, produced the missing 47-year-old Social Security card, and the shop owner ran off a copy before approving the sale. Two days later, on Friday, October 19th, more purchases were made using the newly opened credit account. Several of these transactions were tracked to a Century 21 store located in Westbury, Long Island. FBI investigators traveled to all locations in which their credit cards were used and managed to obtain surveillance video from a number of the ATMs where withdrawals were made, as well as at the Century 21 store. While the jewelry store no longer was in possession of their security footage from that time period, the owner believed he could identify the woman who had made the purchases where he's shown a photo. Investigators quickly determined that both Julia and Dimitri were captured on camera at Century 21, while the ATM video showed only Julia, wearing a large hat. When photos of Julia were shown to the jewelry store owner, he confirmed that that was the woman he'd sold the watches to, who had claimed to be Irina. According to FBI Special Agent Alexi Abrams, they now had evidence of the couple committing identity theft, But with Arena still missing, there were far darker implications. Abrams later explained, quote, We knew at that point in the investigation that something bad had happened, that she was the victim of a crime, end quote. Working with what they had, prosecutors were able to obtain warrants for the arrest of Dimitri and Julia for identity theft. These warrants were issued and served on Friday, July 24th, 2009, more than a year and a half after Arena had disappeared. Federal agents arrived at the couple's Surf Avenue home at 6.30 a.m. and began pounding on the door announcing themselves as the FBI. According to Abrams, Dimitri himself appeared on a second-floor balcony calling down to ask what they wanted. Apparently, after being told they had a warrant for his arrest, Dimitri seemed unfazed, asking if he could get his sunglasses. Moments later, he arrived at the door, nude beneath a bathrobe, and allowed the FBI inside and agreed to let them search the home. Going through the house, 
agents gained access to the safe, in which they found 11 watches, including the Frank Mueller Master Banker that Julia had purchased while pretending to be Irina. In addition to the watches, the FBI sees several computers, financial documents, and the large hat Julia was seen wearing on the ATM video. At that point, both Dimitri and Julia were taken into custody, driven separately to the FBI's downtown Manhattan office for questioning. When interrogated, Dimitri initially denied using Irina's identity and even went so far as to claim he had never met her nor knew who she was. However, according to Agent Abrams, Dimitri did admit to using someone else's credit cards, a man he referred to as Victor. At the time, the FBI didn't know anything about a Victor, but they found it odd that Dimitri claimed to have used the unknown man's credit cards in order to repay a debt alleged to have been approximately $30,000. Investigators kept pushing and digging, and eventually Dimitri admitted that not only did he know Irina, he had in fact used her credit card, but much like in the case of Victor, he claimed this was also to repay a debt. According to Dimitri, he had met Irina through a court case and she had worked for a time to tutor him in English. At some point, he alleged to have loaned Irina approximately $20,000, which he claimed she needed to purchase furniture. Yes, he says he gave her $20,000 to buy furniture. Dimitri went on to tell agents that on October 15th, the day Irina was seen walking through her building's lobby, he had driven his Lexus SUV over to her apartment and she climbed in, handing him her bank card and social security card as a final payment towards the loan, apparently saying now we're even. Unwittingly, Dimitri had now admitted to being the last person to see Arena alive. As questioning continued, Dimitri seemingly became aware that the FBI were now steering the conversation towards murder, prompting him to reply, quote, well, you haven't found a body. How do you know she's dead? End quote. According to Abrams, Dimitri told them that, as far as he knew, Irina had moved back to Russia, which was curious considering she had never lived in Russia. According to the FBI's report, following the conclusion of the interrogation, Dimitri asked what would happen next, at which time he was told he needed to go before a judge. Frustrated, Dimitri apparently complained to investigators that going to court would interfere with a scheduled motorcycle lesson he had that afternoon. He's being confronted about identity theft and potentially murder, and his concern is about a motorcycle lesson. The couple appeared in court separately that day, while U.S. Assistant Attorney James Gatta worked as prosecutor, telling the judge, quote, The government can prove the defendants knew that the person whose identity they used was a real person, and that the person has not been seen since the fraud was committed, end quote. At the time, the charges were all related to identity theft and banking conspiracy, as there was no solid evidence tying either defendant to Arena's disappearance. Anna Val, Julia's lawyer, argued that her client didn't know Arena and suggested that she had heard the woman had returned to Russia, though Val would not reveal who she had heard that from. Ultimately, Dimitri was remanded without bond, while Julia was held pending her ability to meet bail which was set at $500,000. A week later, in early August, Julia was released on bond while Dimitri remained in jail. During this time, investigators began digging into their lives and discovered that they were doing fairly well financially. The couple had two children, owned two homes, including their Surf Avenue house in the ritzy Seagate community of Coney Island, and had a financial stake in a bakery in Russia. Beyond that, Dimitri had worked in real estate, purchasing properties seized from foreclosures before flipping them for a profit. In order to find more answers, Special Agent Abrams printed off a list of every address Dimitri had ever been affiliated with and began going door to door, searching for neighbors who may have known him over the years. While, for the most part, they weren't able to find anyone who could provide them with much information, there was one thing that was clear. Seemingly, no one who knew Dimitri liked him, with most people describing him as mean, creepy, or both. This even included members of the Russian mafia who said they knew of Dimitri but didn't like him and didn't want him hanging around them. 
At one particular building, however, on Manhattan Avenue, Abrams would pick up a thread that would lead this case in a direction he never could have imagined. In an attempt to gather additional information about Dimitri and Julia, Special Agent Abrams began visiting all current and former neighbors. This would eventually lead him to 4120 Manhattan Avenue, just around the corner from their Surf Avenue home. Speaking to one tenant of the building, Abrams was told that he needed to speak to the landlord, a man named Alexander Basiliga. Basiliga had changed his name upon emigrating to the United States and instead went by Alexander Hamilton, so that is how I will refer to him. When Abrams reached out to Hamilton and brought up Dimitri's name, Hamilton apparently told him that he had a lot of information on Yakovlev. According to Hamilton, he'd met Dimitri years earlier, and since they were from the same general area of Russia, they quickly became friends and got along. Hamilton went on to explain that in 2003, he came to know a man named Michael Klein. Klein, who had previously been a civilian employee of the NYPD, had lived much of his life as a hoarder. Klein owned a home at 4120 Manhattan Avenue, which had been subdivided into several different apartments. Much of the street level was filled with items Klein had kept for years. Old newspapers, books, car parts, construction materials. The area was so filled with stuff that Klein actually had to sleep upstairs in a different apartment because there was no room downstairs. Hamilton showed an interest in the building and Klein explained that he was planning to move to Mastic on Long Island to live with his girlfriend and he'd be willing to sell. Ultimately, the two worked out a deal where Hamilton would purchase the home for $410,000. Closing on the sale of the home took place on November 23, 2003. At the time, Dimitri asked Hamilton to list Julia on the deed in order to illegally represent income, which they'd chosen not to declare through previous home-flipping sales. At the time, Hamilton agreed, but he'd quickly regret that decision. Hamilton provided Klein with a $7,000 check, while Julia was set to give him one for $13,000. However, after closing, Hamilton went to the building and found it deserted, with no sign of Klein and all of the doors locked. Contacting Dimitri, he asked if he knew what had happened to Klein, and Dimitri apparently told him that he'd seen the man drive off in his white Toyota earlier that night. The next morning, when Hamilton came down to the home, he was startled to find Dimitri already inside. Asking how he'd gotten in, Dimitri claimed that the door wasn't locked, and he'd arrived and found a large ring of keys on the table, which offered entry to all of the divided apartments. According to Hamilton, Dimitri made it sound as though Klein must have left everything behind for them to make it easier before he left town. Hamilton asked Dimitri again about Klein, and this time he replied by saying that the man had gotten a lot of money and probably decided just to move to Florida. When Klein's girlfriend showed up searching for him as he'd never made it out to Mastic, Hamilton claims that Dimitri hurled insults at her and told her that now that Klein was rich, he wanted nothing to do with her. Dimitri later handed Hamilton a check for $7,000 and asked him to deposit it. The check was the same one Hamilton had given Klein at the closing, and when asked about this, Dimitri claimed that before driving off, Klein had handed him the check and asked him to return it to Alex. At that point, Dimitri offered to begin clearing the junk out of the bottom floor while Hamilton was set to tackle the apartment upstairs where Klein had lived and slept. Curiously, Hamilton found all of Klein's clothing left behind and the keys to his car. Not long after, police in Newark, New Jersey, approximately 20 miles away, discovered an abandoned white Toyota. At the time, they impounded the vehicle, but didn't conduct any further investigation as, in such a high-crime area, an abandoned vehicle wasn't all that uncommon or concerning. Hamilton continued to grow suspicious of Dimitri's behavior, as when he offered to help clearing out the bottom floor, Dimitri would always decline. It was strange, since Hamilton had purchased the building so that he and his wife could move in. So why Dimitri was working so hard made little sense. One night, after celebrating his anniversary with his wife, Hamilton arrived at the home to find something strange. 
Dimitri had completely renovated the first floor bathroom, replacing the tile, the toilet, and even stripping and repainting the tub. When asked why he had done this, Dimitri said it was a gift to the happy couple. Unfortunately, the relationship between the two friends would sour shortly after the purchase of the home. According to Hamilton, Dimitri had showed up at his place with all manner of financial documents related to Michael Klein. He had his birth certificate, account numbers, credit cards, and even his driver's license. At that time, Dimitri asked Hamilton, who worked as a computer programmer, to help him break into Klein's bank accounts and steal his money, but Hamilton declined. Angry and frustrated, Dimitri then warned Hamilton, saying, quote, Watch yourself now, you know more than you should. End quote. Not long after this, Dimitri demanded that Hamilton pay him $100,000 to remove Julia's name from the deed. Hamilton refused, and so the two eventually had to go to court, where they were aided by a Russian language translator named Irina Malezik. After paperwork was completed that night, Irina asked if there was anyone who could give her a ride home, and it was Dimitri who volunteered. The FBI found their investigation leading them into a completely different world. Not only did they have evidence tying the Yakovlevs to financial fraud following Irina's disappearance, Dimitri had admitted to being the last person to see her alive. Now, they also had the missing man, Michael Klein, who Dimitri was apparently also the last person to see alive, and much like in Irina's case, he somehow came into possession of all of Klein's financial information. Special Agent Abrams explained, quote, That was very disturbing for us, the fact that there might be multiple victims. We knew this was going to turn this case into something bigger than just an identity theft case. End quote. On Monday, August 17, 2009, the FBI arrived at the Yakovlev Surf Avenue home in Seagate with a warrant to search the premises. According to the Daily News, a team of agents from both the FBI's evidence collection team as well as NYPD detectives brought along digging equipment and began focusing in on the home's basement. Julia, out on bail, was home at the time and was very upset about the digging, but there was little she could do against the warrant which had been signed by a Brooklyn federal court judge. Asked why they were at the home, FBI spokesman David Schaefer told the media, quote, this search is being conducted for the remains of Irina Malezik, a Russian-language federal court translator who mysteriously disappeared on October 15, 2007, after leaving her Brighton Beach co-op. The search is ongoing, and at this point, no evidence has been recovered. End quote. It was later revealed by the FBI that a neighbor had informed them that in October of 2007, the month Irina vanished, Dimitri had hired a crew to dig his basement floor deeper. Once the depth was reached, the neighbor helped Dimitri remove construction materials and soil from the basement, at which time he noted a foul stench. When he asked Dimitri about it, he told him that his dog had been using the area to relieve himself, though the neighbor saw no signs that a dog had been down in that basement. Later, Dimitri borrowed a cement mixer from this same neighbor, saying he wanted to pour the new basement floor himself. Kenneth Russo, Dimitri's defense attorney, blasted investigators in the media upon learning about the dig. Frustrated with what he believed was a complete lack of evidence to obtain a warrant and what he considered the unnecessary destruction of his client's home, Russo explained, quote, There has been no evidence disclosed in open court that points to my client or his wife in regards to the disappearance. They are not charged with a homicide. They're not charged with any crime that would warrant the FBI to take their home apart. Both of them deny any knowledge or involvement whatsoever regarding the disappearance of the victim here. The lack of evidence yielded from the FBI search will prove that. End quote. When investigators arrived in the home's basement, they discovered that while Dimitri had poured concrete to lay a new floor, he'd only completed about half the job. At the time, cadaver dogs were brought into the basement where they hid on several locations. Holes were drilled into the concrete, leading the dogs to make further indications, and ultimately jackhammers were brought in to rip through the concrete. One particular dog also led investigators off into the boiler room to a box which appeared to be Christmas decorations. Upon opening the box, 
Investigators found several crumpled up Russian language newspapers stuffed inside. These papers were dated to January of 2008, the week Irina's disappearance had finally hit the front page. Ultimately, the dig at the home lasted for 10 days. Though no human remains were recovered, there were several items of interest found. Firstly, They found a clump of long, brown-colored hair, which appeared to be consistent with the color and style in which Irina had worn hers. In a filing cabinet, they'd found a large manila envelope, inside of which were pornographic photos of a man and woman engaged in sexual acts. At the time, they couldn't identify the man in the photos, though he closely resembled Dimitri. The woman, who they could not identify as Irina, remained unknown, prompting them to wonder if she was someone they should seek out for questioning, or maybe another victim they'd yet to become aware of. Back in the boiler room, investigators found a thick ring of keys, which stirred up memories of how Alexander Hamilton had described Michael Klein's keys. Special Agent Abrams explained, quote, I immediately linked the keys as belonging to Michael Klein, because Dmitry Yakovlev's apartment was rather small. It was a single-family home. The only residence I knew that Dmitry was associated with that was so extensive to require that number of keys was 4120 Manhattan Avenue, end quote. Perhaps, most disturbingly, the FBI also recovered a pair of women's panties, found sealed in a plastic bag, which had been inside of the box in the boiler room, A DNA test would later confirm traces of Irina's DNA on the panties. At this point, Dimitri and Julia became the prime suspects in her disappearance, and at least Dimitri was being considered as a possible answer to the mysterious disappearance of Michael Klein. However, the FBI could not have imagined this story was far from over. While the Surf Avenue home was being ripped apart in search of information, DNA, evidence of a body, or anything they could find that would tie Arena to Dimitri, Abrams continued on with his work, once again going door to door and speaking with neighbors of the Yakovlevs, Irina, and Michael Klein. At one of the buildings they canvassed, one tenant told them if they wanted to know more about Dimitri, they needed to speak to another man, a man named Victor. This was the first time since Dimitri had mentioned that name during his initial interrogation that investigators had heard it, so of course they wanted to track him down. He would later be identified as Viktor Alexeyev, a former neighbor of Yakovlev's. Pulling his address, Special Agent Abrams arrived and knocked on the door, but Viktor wasn't there. Instead, he met a man named Ravil Kassenchine, who was now living in the apartment. When asked where Viktor was, Abrams could never have imagined the answer he'd received. Reveal explained, quote, Victor's dead. The guy murdered him, whose basement you're digging up right now. He was my friend and landlord, and I suspect Dmitry Yakovlev murdered him and stole his identity. Next week, in part two of our look into the disappearance of Irina Malezik, We'll examine the details behind the disappearance of Viktor Alexeyev, the discovery of his mutilated remains, a creepy Dracula mass found near the dump site, a watch connecting Dmitri to yet another victim, Dmitri's former residence and its proximity to multiple pieces of evidence connected to three disappearances, the trial of Dmitri Yakovlev, Julia Yakovlev's plea deal, and the details surrounding a yet unidentified John Doe who may or may not have been one of Dimitri's first victims after emigrating to the United States. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, 
Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levinen, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. Before closing out this episode, I wanted to take a moment to mention this as I'm sure it will annoy some folks. Some of my pronunciation in these episodes is likely a little off. I've done the best I could to ensure I pronounce all of the names accurately, but I've found multiple pronunciations and I've tried to get as close as possible. Beyond that, I really want to give a lot more background information into Irina's life prior to living in the U.S., but it's been really difficult to track down. I spent a lot of hours browsing through Ukrainian and Russian sites, translating them in search for more information, but it really just led to a lot of dead ends. So, I've given you all that I could possibly find. As for now, this wraps up part one of our look into the disappearance of Irina Malezik. I want to again thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for the disturbing and shocking conclusion in The Disappearance of Irina Malezik, Part 2. <laughs>